turn with me in your Bible, if you will, back to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to dive right back into where we left off last week, Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 11, reading down through verse 16. The Apostle Paul is continuing uh, writing to these people that he knows, people that he loves, people that he longs to see, and he just wants to encourage them as best he can and strengthen their faith. And today he uh, has a corrective word for them, an instructive word for them, and it, it fits right here where we're at at Harrisburg as well. Let me read to you verse 11 down to verse 16. And we will jump off to see what Paul has to say. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, Strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, therefore killing the hostility. Father, as we look further deep into your word, again, I pray to you, I, I plead for every person in this room that we will hear, that our attention span will be long, that our, our attention span will be clear, and that we will be able to focus on you. And Holy Spirit, please help me. Help all of us to see exactly what is in your word for us this day, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You've heard said before, you've probably heard from me before, that there is nothing better for God's people than a steady diet of God's Word. And that's what we're going to get today. I had a seminary professor years ago, stood up in class and said something. At, at first hearing, it was kind of shocking. He said, the worst thing you can do in a pulpit is to try to get everybody in the room saved every single Sunday. You need to feed the people. You need to feed the church. Don't always try to be an evangelist. Try to be somebody that feeds the people because a church, much like a plant or animal, if you don't feed it, it will weather and dry up and die. And so I hope today that you as a believer, if you are a believer in Christ, I hope and pray that this will feed you, that will encourage you and strengthen your walk. That's the whole point of what Paul is getting across here. He's not trying to get anyone saved in these words. He's trying to instruct them. He's trying to strengthen them. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to do it as he tells us to in verse 11. We're going to start practicing remembering not to forget where God has brought us from. And this is a pleasant exercise if you'll simply do it. To remember not to forget what Christ has brought you from. There is a great jumping off point back a couple of pages in your Bible. Don't turn there. Stay right there in Ephesians 2. But way back in Acts chapter 21, Paul has made his way back to Jerusalem after being gone on a very lengthy missionary trip. On that missionary trip, he makes his way through the city of Ephesus, and in Ephesus, he begins to spread the gospel, spread the word, and people respond. And as people respond to Paul's preaching and teaching, a church 
forms there in Ephesus. That's why you have this letter to the Ephesians. He's somewhere writing back to that church in Ephesus. While he was there meeting with these people and encouraging these people and discipling these people, there was one young man, Trophinius. You don't know that name. It's one of those obscure Bible names, but he's there. He's an Ephesian. He's a Greek. He's a Gentile. And that's what you need to key in on. This man, Trophinius, was a Gentile in Jerusalem with the Apostle Paul just after they got back from a missionary journey. The first place Paul goes is to the temple. As he goes to the temple, he, he knows that only Jews can go into certain parts. Only men can go into certain parts of that big, massive building. Later on, as you read into Acts chapter 21, a riot begins because people see Paul and this Gentile and somebody starts a rumor, somebody starts a play on words here that there has been a Gentile in the temple. We have no proof of that. Paul knew better than that. But there was a riot. Long story short, Paul ended up being arrested, put in chains, and for the rest of his life, Paul's a prisoner. For the rest of the book of Acts, Paul is going here, going there, getting on a boat, sailing over there as a prisoner making his way to Rome. And the book of Acts ends with Paul being a prisoner under house arrest, all because of what happened here with this Gentile from Ephesus. While he was in jail, we know he sat down with a pen under chains and wrote the letter that you're looking at. Dear Ephesians, I miss you. Dear Ephesians, I I long to be with you. Let me remind you that you were once lost in your sins, so lost that you were dead in your sins. This is what we saw last week. Dead people can do absolutely nothing for themselves. What Paul was getting as a report from Ephesus, was that in this new church, these new believers, some of them were former Jews who were clinging tightly to their former traditions and wanting to hang on to their Jewishness while they became Christians as well. And then there were Gentiles mixed in, and these Gentiles, they had no frame of reference when it came to the Old Testament, when it came to the God of these Jews. They were just simply happy to be there And so this church was just a potpourri of beliefs and backgrounds. Paul's writing a letter saying, simply put, all of you were dead. All of you were lost. All of you needed Christ. And now he has saved you to become one family, one after him, one under him. He was writing to heal this rift. The Gentile brothers and sisters knew nothing of Abraham and Moses and David. It's almost like the Jewish believers, the Jewish Christians had a head start on them and they had to catch up. This was a rift indeed, but it was more than just a learning curve. It turned out to be a great separation. And these people, this this group, they they were divided in two different ways. The first thing I want you to see in verse 11 There was a great social divide amongst them. The word social, the the word uncircumcision, you see there in verse 11. This was a deriding nickname. It was a put down. The Jewish people, of course, were circumcised. And as the Gentile brothers and sisters in Christ would join them, they would call them uncircumcised. Oh, look, there's the uncircumcised guys. There's the uncircumcised family. In other words, it was a social put down and it hurt. These Jewish people were putting trust in a mark on their bodies. They were putting trust in something that was done by hand, as verse 11 explains. And if you put your trust in anything other than Christ to make yourself right with Christ, you are, as I would tell you, putting the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. Think about that. You're putting the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. 
you're thinking wrong. These Christian Gentiles, they wanted to be right with Christ, but they had to worry about their Jewish brothers and sisters putting them down daily. That was a social divide. But also in verse 12, something much deeper, you'll see that it was also a spiritual divide. Here you see it's not just enough for these Gentile believers to contend with the relationships that they had with their new Jewish brothers and sisters. Now, they were having to contend with, am I doing enough to please God? Am I doing enough to make him pleased and happy with me? Is my relationship with God enough? Is it solid? Is it pure? All I'm hearing from my Jewish brothers and sisters that I'm, I'm lacking something. I'm missing something. And you got to know this. Verse 12 is packed. It is power packed in descriptions of what they were like, and get this, pre-Christ. What your life was like before Christ. Christ. Hence, in verse 11 and in verse 12, Paul tells them twice, remember, recall, think about what you were like before Christ found you. Paul says there were five things in your life back then, before Christ, that you were lacking. The first is simply put, they were lacking in their place with Christ. They were lacking in having a proper placement in Jesus. Verse 12 again says that they were separated from him. This word separated is a medical term put together by our friend Hippocrates. He was a Greek, an ancient Greek, father of medicine, gave us the Hippocratic oath that all of our medical people know by heart. That word separated it was written by him to... Describe what it was like if you took the ankle joint, the knee joint, the hip joint, the elbow joint, the wrist joint, the shoulder joint, and you just pulled those joints apart. If you pull a, a knee joint and you sever it, that limb is no good. It's useless. It has no strength. It has no power on its own. It is separated from the rest of the body. This is what it was like to be a Gentile pre-Christ. You are separated from him. Now remember, they did not have Genesis through Malachi. They had no frame of reference for Noah and the ark, David and Goliath, Rahab. They didn't know these great stories. They didn't know the Ten Commandments. They were starting from scratch. They had no history of a deity working for their good, as did the Jewish people. They had no idea that there was a Messiah on the horizon coming to save them. They did not know what to expect. They did not even know who to look for. They were separated from Christ. Also, they were lacking a people to belong in. Verse 12 continues to say that they were excluded from Israel. If you know Genesis 12 and the story of Abraham, Abraham was minding his own business one night. He was called out of his tent to look up at the stars. This is a promise of God. I will give you these many descendants. You will be my people. You will never be without a God to follow. The Gentiles did not have that promise. They did not have the Abraham covenant. They didn't have a pl place. They didn't have a people. They were excluded from God's economy. We know the Jews, even today, are known as God's chosen people, the apple of his eye, meaning he is laser-focused on them. But again, the Gentiles, they know nothing of that promise. In fact, if you fast forward in your mind over to John chapter 4, Jesus meets a woman at a well, and this lady starts a discussion with Jesus about theology and worship. You Jews say that we are supposed to worship down there in Jerusalem, but we worship up here. And Jesus flat out looks her in the face and says, you worship what you do not know. You have no idea who you are even praying to. They have no place to be, no people to belong to. But also in verse 12, they were lacking any promises to cling to. 
Verse 12 says that you were strangers to the covenants. You were foreigners to the covenant. Again, Genesis 12, Abraham's covenant did not apply these pe- to these people. Neither did the Mosaic law. Neither did the Davidic covenant, which is the promise to David that Israel will always have a king. And before Bethlehem, before Jesus, they didn't even have the new covenant with which to fall in line with. Now, these are big fancy words, Davidic and Abrahamic and Mosaic. All that means is God is dealing with his people on a first name basis. I will provide for you. I will protect you. I will always be with you, with you, not the Gentiles. Now, after Christ, after Easter, these Gentiles are being grafted in, as Paul would say. And now all of these things apply to you. Now you do have God's promises. Now you are part of God's people. Acts chapter 8. Again, just go there in your mind. Acts chapter 8. We see Philip meeting a man from the far off land of Ethiopia. Reading the Old Testament. And it's a passage from Isaiah that deals with the suffering servant. If you remember, what does the Ethiopian ask Philip? Who is this? I've never heard of this this, this man. I'm a Gentile. I'm clueless. Can you imagine what it would be like to live your entire life? Not only do you not know Christ, you've never even heard his name. It'd be paralyzing. Going back to verse 12, they're also lacking a future to look forward to. Verse 12 says you were without hope. You had no hope, zero hope. No future is the embodiment of having no hope. You have no Christ. You have no nation. You have no promises. That equals zero hope. Now, that's not to say a Gentile could not understand what it was like to be hopeful. They're in prison. I sure hope my attorney finds some new evidence to get me out of here. I hope my team wins today. I hope it does not rain. All of these things prove that you can be hopeful, but when it comes to matters of eternity, what would they place their hope in? Their education? Their 401k? Their good looks? What was the object of their hope? Simply put, no Christ, no forgiveness. No forgiveness no eternity. Again, 12 is packed. If you look back at 12, they were lacking all of these things, but they were also lacking a true God to trust in. Without God, you are without hope, no hope, and without God in the world. That phrase, without God, you know that because you've seen this. In the original language, the word God is Theo, T-H-E-O, Theo, that means God. If you ever want to say no to something in that language, you just put an A in front of it, like nada. It's not there. A, Theo. Put them together, what do you have? You guys are atheists. Atheists. You have no God. You have no hope. There is nothing for you to put your future into, nothing for you to look back on. You're just going through life. Again, John 4, with this woman at the well, You can see what it looks like to live your life as a atheist. Paul, confronting the religious minds in Athens. I see that you are a religious people. You even have an altar up to this unknown God. That's the God I want to talk to you about. The Gentiles had gods, but no amount of a God with a little g is going to do anything for you to make you right with the one true God. Pre-Christ, This is where the Gentiles of Ephesus stood. Before their salvation, verse 12 is an incredible commentary on their relationship with God pre-Christ. Paul, again, as I said earlier, has a very specific remedy, very specific prescription, a very specific instruction for these people and for Harrisburg today And it's found in the very first word of verse 12. Here's what I want you guys and gals to do. 
Remember those times. Remember your life before Christ found you. Think back and recall. Remember not to forget where God found you. And realize this, he did not leave you there. Last week, the last couple of weeks, in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 8 and following, you were dead, dead, lifeless. You were helpless. This does not mean that you were just simply injured or limping through life and then a Band-Aid or a Tylenol would help you. Tylenol does not help dead people. You need more than that. You need saving. And you cannot save yourself. As one of the early church fathers said, commenting on these particular verses, you're more likely to lasso the moon with a rope made out of sand than to save yourself. What you saw last week puts a great emphasis on God. Finding someone that lost, that sinful, that dead. But God, but God being rich in mercy with his great love for us, raised us up. He found us and did not leave us there. Paul adds to that same thread here in verse 13. Last week you saw, but God in verse 13, but now in Christ. But God saved you, but now in Christ. Ephesians, think back to your not too distant future. Spiritually speaking, you were dead. I had a mentor years ago, put it this way. He said, imagine your soul lying at the bottom of the darkest, deepest part of the greatest ocean on the earth. And the teeth of a thousand angry sharks have ripped you to shreds. You have no hope for something better unless something rescues you. For us, it would be someone rescuing you. Now, here's the $64 million questions. That is Ephesus. That is ancient. That is years ago. That's what Paul is saying to those men and women. What about us now? Well, I've already hinted, this fits us too. What's good for the Ephesians is good for Harrisburg. I'm not asking, nor do I think Paul is asking anyone to go back to their past and pitch a tent. Don't stay there. Don't live there. Don't dwell mentally there. But it's always good just to cast a glancing eye backwards. Because when you see what you have been saved from, then and only then can you truly know Christ, enjoy Christ, worship Christ as you should. That is what Paul is giving us a glimpse into doing today. Never, ever forget. Always remember to look back and to see what Jesus has done for you. Well, what exactly has he done for you? I'm glad you asked because I want to tell you. Verse 13. I want you to think about this. Here's what Jesus has done for me and for any other believer here. Christ brings us near to God. We can know him. We can speak to him. We can fellowship with him. His promises are not just for another group of people, but now they're for us as well. And when he returns, he's coming for us. That's one thing that he's done for us, but that's not enough. There's even more. You can see on the screen, verse 14, he brings us peace. No more of us versus them. No more circumcision or not. No more we have God and you're missing out. No, we are part of the family. Every promise of the Bible belongs to you and me. That's peace. Verse 15. He also brings us rest. He brings us near to God. He brings us peace. He brings us rest. You know what rest looks like? No more struggling to make God happy. 
No more struggling to check all the right boxes, wondering, am I good enough? Will he accept me? The law and its commands are good. They are good for me, but I cannot keep them all. I, I don't want to struggle to have to worry. Am I doing enough? Am I doing right? At the end of the day, can I rest? Otherwise, you're simply a lost person checking boxes, trying to impress a God that is unimpressible. Christianity is not a works-based religion. We have rest as our foundation. Jesus paid it all. He didn't pay just some of it. Verse 16, lastly, Christ brings us reconciliation. That's a big $10 word that simply means friendship. He brings us back together. Two warring parties are now at peace. They've come together. They can sit and they can fellowship. Gone is the struggle to keep up. Gone is the struggle to try to fit in as a Gentile. God has made us one in him and with him. There is no more wall of hostility. I have no more boxes to check because I cannot keep up with the law anyway. Whether this is a physical law, a physical wall in a temple or church like ours, it's all gone. Nothing can separate me now from the God that loves me and the God that saved me. Christ and only Christ brings that healing power. Only Christ can reconcile not only you and other people and bring peace amongst you, but only Christ can bring peace between you and the God that made you. And all humanity needs this. I don't care who you are. All humanity needs reconciliation to God. And note this. I don't want to skip over this. Note in verse 16, how does he do this? What is Jesus' mode of operation in order to provide all of these things? His cross. He went to the cross, that's the Easter story, and he died so that you and I could have peace with God, that your sins could be forgiven, that no more boxes need to be checked. He basically picked up the cross, dipped it in blood, and checked the box once and for all. There's nothing else for you to do. I want you to know Jesus. If, you, if you're here today and you don't know Christ like this, I, I want this for you. I deeply desire this for you. And there is no other way to know him outside of Christ. You cannot follow him. You cannot worship him. You cannot have eternity with him outside of Christ. So let me wrap this up with this nice little bow. Just something for you to put in your pocket. Something for you to think about as you go the rest of your day. Words like nearness, peace, rest, friendship, reconciliation. I pray those words sound familiar to you. These are things that you have experienced in your own life. I pray that for you. I pray that when you take a look back at your life pre-Christ, you can see exactly what Jesus brought you out of and now you are enjoying the benefits that are on the screen only by him, only through him, only for him. That is a beautiful place to be. Yes, I have got a past, but because of Christ, it's gone. And because of Christ, I have a future. Or, door number two, you're a believer. Yet you fail to ever look back and to see the goodness of Christ in your life. You are set up as you are now and you have your fire insurance and that's good enough. No service, no knowledge, no growth, no sanctification. You're not enjoying any of these benefits that you see before you. This is not beautiful. McClav, I've, 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 I know I'm a believer and I've got a really good life. I've got good things going for me. Three times in all three of the synoptic gospels, Jesus asked this question. What would it profit a man to gain the entire world and yet lose his soul? 
Or door number three, what if? What if words like nearness, peace, rest, reconciliation, what if me using words like that seem like a foreign language to you? Like you're in a foreign country and you simply don't speak the language. This means nothing. Spiritually speaking, you feel like you're a million miles from God. You have no sense of peace, no sense of rest in your life, and you're really uncertain about your future. Could that be you? Maybe. And this is the heart of what Paul is getting at. Is that he wants all of Ephesus to know Jesus and to know the benefits of knowing Jesus. And if you know Jesus, look back, see what he's brought you through and praise him and rejoice over that. But if you look back and you think, I don't see any of that. I don't see my checkered past. I'm still in it. I'm still in the throes of it. I don't want you. I, I'm saying this as a pastor. I don't, I don't want you anymore to be separated from Christ, alienated from his people, strangers without hope, without God in this world. You know yourself better than anyone. And if you think that God is totally unapproachable, you can reread this section of passages that we just read earlier. Read these again and, and, and just key in on the phrase, those who were far off, you have now through Christ, you've been brought near. You've been brought near. Hear me clearly. Get this if you get nothing else. Anyone, anywhere, at any time can be saved by Christ. I'm going to say that again. Anyone, anywhere, at any time can be saved by Christ. And this is the challenge that I'm going to lay before you. If you're a believer... If you, know, if you know Christ like you know Christ, he is your king. He is your Messiah. When he comes back, you know exactly what you're looking for. If you died right now, you know exactly where you're headed. I'm going to challenge you as Paul challenged the Ephesians in verses 11 and 12. Remember, remember what you were like pre-Christ. Remember what your life was like before your salvation where he found you and he saved you and he cleaned you and he secured you. Or, or, be reconciled to him this day. This is at the other end, the bookend, if you will, of the section that we read in verse 16. Be reconciled to him right now so that, you, so that you can do these things. Remember or be reconciled. That's the two options you have. Clay, how does this work? Pretty simple. And it's free. It will not cost you a dime. On behalf of the pastors, the ministers, the staff, the deacons, the Sunday school teachers, Everyone that's involved with Harrisburg Baptist Church, I want you to know, those of you who are listening that are outside of Christ, that this is talking to you. You're needing to be reconciled. Hear me. We at Harrisburg not just love you and care for you, we want you. And I don't necessarily mean that we want you to be a church member, although I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a better church family. We want you to be a church member. But more than that, we want you to be a family member. We want you here with us in Christ. No more do we want you alienated out by yourself. We want you here with us. Moreover, Jesus wants you. Jesus will save you. Jesus will bring you into his family. In just a few minutes, or just a few moments, 
You're going to stand up as you always do, and Jason's going to come, and we're going to be led in what we call a hymn of invitation, a hymn of challenge, something that just gives you a moment to think, to ponder everything that you've seen here in Scripture today. Not from me, but from Paul, from the Holy Spirit, from Ephesians. We're going to stand, and as you stand, not just hang on a second, let me give you the instructions. You're going to stand, and I'm going to pray. And as I pray, some of our staff and other ministers will be out in the back. You'll recognize them because they've got a name tag on. I'll be down front. And as we're singing, or as we leave for Sunday school, would you take advantage of an opportunity to grab one of us and just ask us, or just say the words, I need to be reconciled. I need to be saved. Will you pray for me? Will you show me how this is supposed to happen? Those are pretty, pretty specific details. But that's what we desire. Stand, pray, sing. And as we do those things, you're going to seek Christ. So Jason's going to come. You're going to stand to your feet. Stand now. We will be led. I'm going to pray, and then you're going to seek Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we give you this moment, as we give you this time, I pray for the men and women in this room. I pray that as believers, that we will do just as Paul instructed, that we will remember what our life was like pre-Christ. Now, many may be just like me, saved at a young age and have what I call a boring testimony. That you've just been good to me my whole life. Thank you. But there may no doubt others be in this very room. They're running around trying to please you. They're just trying to find out more about you. They've got questions. They've got fears. They just want to know what to believe and how to put their faith in you. Holy Spirit, will you be kind? Will you speak to them in a way only you can? Will you woo them? Will you bring them to you? Will you do that this day? Will you help our Harrisburg people be welcoming and loving and kind as, as other people are coming into our church and seeking you? And we pray this in your name. Amen.